the motivation for my work in this area over the past 20 to 25 years really lies in the fact that you know, when it comes to uh, health uh, policy challenges, um, we're dealing with um, systems which uh, are increasingly complex uh, in, a, in a dynamic sense I'll define in, in just a minute. Um, and just as examples of, of, of many of these, um, but I've only shown you know, a few examples, um, we have syndemics of mutually interacting conditions. For example, here we work at this intersection of, of COVID-19 and, and overdose-related deaths from, from substance abuse. Um, this real burden of health disparities uh, across different socioeconomic divides uh, or between a uh, developing world and uh, developed world. Uh, distressing gaps in terms of mental health brought into sharper contrast by the pandemic. Um, we see it in the, the high levels of obesity, which manifest in, in many different chronic diseases and cancers, diabetes, heart disease, um, uh, challenges associated with, um, with several types of, of cancer that are secondary to obesity. And despite a great deal of progress in understanding the mechanisms by which obesity is developed, we still haven't uh, been able to really contain this, this epidemic of, of diabetes effectively. We see it in life course impacts across uh, from, from childhood to adulthood with really long shadows cast by, by early life trauma, uh, adverse childhood experiences and social determinants of health, and many other areas, some of them manifested by those in the room wearing masks at this very minute associated with this, uh, this troubling and, and terrible pandemic um, with which we're engulfed. And what all these, uh, these challenges share is that they, they point to the, um, gnarly character and, and the difficulty of, of really addressing um, the, the policy challenges of complex systems. When I use the term complex here, I'm meaning something more than complicated, having many different pieces. I'm, I'm talking about systems which are in some sense dynamically complex. Uh, they exhibit a set of features whereby the behavior of the whole is very different than behavior of the parts. We can take the system apart and and analyze each of its pieces, but still not understand the system as a whole, much as you know, we could understand the axle type and engine type and color and body make of every car you know, along a highway, but still not understand why traffic jams uh, develop. A traffic jam is a systems problem that transcends any one of its pieces, any one of the vehicles or their make or their their mechanical design. Uh, it's something that's at a higher level that transcends that. Um, so it is with dynamically complex systems. The whole is surprisingly distinct from the parts. And these systems um, are not merely intellectual curiosities. They, they really um, are at the heart of many of our challenges because amongst other things, they react surprisingly and pervasively when we try to intervene. If we poke it one place, it pops out in other places. It reacts uh, to us, and uh, often in surprising ways that lead our policies to go astray. There's siloed and limited understanding often within these systems for us to make progress in addressing um, the challenges that, that are across them. There's this link between cause and effect that's often delayed, uh, distal, multifaceted, and often reciprocal. A causes B and B causes A. Um, and uh, they're, they're often nonlinear. And when we combine different interventions, we get very, very different impacts than if we simply sum up the benefits of each intervention separately and total them. And these systems are marked by a number of hallmarks I don't have time to go into, but they include things like feedbacks and path dependence, cases of this reciprocal causality, delays, nonlinearities, and these patterns of emergence where the, what we see at a high level is just very different from at the low level. There's many examples of these systems on which I work. For example, in the opioid epidemic or antimicrobial resistance. But the thing I wanted to talk today about is, is the food system. Um, here too, we, we see um, you know, feedbacks. We see um, 
uh, the occurrence of sales and unhealthy goods spurring optimization and marketing of low prices for unhealthy goods, such as by stripping out the need for refrigeration from the supply chain, such as optimizing the production of, of long preserving goods loaded with fat and sugar content, um, which can be sold very cheaply, marketed very effectively, but ultimately uh, are very unhealthy for people and those lead to yet more sales. Um, there's, uh, by contrast, there are feedbacks which are positive sometimes with disparities such as are glaring in the nutrition area, trying to motivate some impetus towards policy, but where that policy needs judicious guidance. Uh, there's delays. Um, it can take a long time for consumer attitudes and knowledge about how to prepare food with new types of food to adjust, um, which can make it difficult for healthy foods to make inroads. Um, and where in order to, to be available uh, at cheaper, more accessible levels, there needs to be widespread system-wide distribution, retail, uh, manufacturing investments. We have diverse actors across it, from the growers to the wholesalers, the distributors, the consumers, the food pantries, institutional clients, and restaurants. And um, there's real lock-in effects whereby the system can get stuck in a state such as through marketing of unhealthy foods that's very different, difficult to dislodge because of the high price effectiveness of those models that is almost built into the system. Um, and uh, for all these reasons, we've suffered policy resistance. You know, healthy food investments can even sometimes hear widen disparities by leading to uptake among wealthier individuals, but not be uptaken by, by uh, poorer individuals. And you know, past contributors such as uh, here, the Shift N Solutions, um, have tried to map out elements of the food system, uh, which stretches from consumers to the, to the value chain that delivers food to them nested in areas of socio-cultural context um, in civil society, but also extends to the agricultural area and environmental areas that support it. In a systems which have uh, dizzying numbers of feedbacks and complexity associated with that. I believe May has shared this um, visual with you, um, which, which documents in a little bit more of a granular way the um, the supply chain that brings food to our to our tables every day for our consumption, but which consists of linkages to a vast number of different parties and a very complex set of distribution networks. And often when we're dealing with systems like this, whether it's the opioid epidemic or food systems, you know, we feel a little bit like blind men and the elephant. Each of us is an expert in one part of the system, the elephant's ear or its trunk or its tusk or indeed its tail. Each of us groping blindly and feeling that that part, we've discovered the essence of the elephant. We know the important part of the elephant that makes it tick. But of course, if we want to stop this, uh, this mammoth, uh, mammoth creature from trampling the crops, we need to understand the elephant as a whole and recognize that each of these pieces is part of it, but it's interconnected with the rest. And if we ignore the rest of it, we're sure to get trampled ourselves. Um, the challenges here are particularly, um, particularly uh, difficult in, the area, in two areas that I'll broadly characterize the need to explain and the need to intervene. In the explanation area, there's some obvious and seemingly simple problems. You know, does the evidence support my hypothesis about what's going on there, about why we're not seeing uptake of, of, of say, healthy foods promoted by WIC, the Women, Infants, and Children Program in California and some of the poorest neighborhoods? Or where we want to understand where's this likely to go next? Um, or what's driving these patterns that we see? And during the COVID-19 um, uh, epidemic, we've seen you know, policymakers um, with no previous exposure to modeling trying to grapple with this dizzying complexity of interpreting different time series. Um, here are hospitalizations and new cases, a number of tests and uh, test positivity and uh, number in, in ICU, the intensive care units, et cetera. 
over time. And even if you just look at two of them, like cases and test volumes, what you see is a very complex story. There's reciprocal causality. New cases who present for care, come to a hospital for care, drive the need for tests, to test them to see if they're infected with COVID-19. At the same time, if we set up drive-through testing sites or, or we do door-to-door -door screening for an area of, of particular at-risk individuals for, for COVID-19 uh, positivity, then we're having tests that drive cases. So there's reciprocal causality that requires us to look at these as more than solitudes. They are somehow pointing us to an underlying system. Each of them whispers on some particular aspect of it. Each of them is a different face of the underlying Janus. Um, and you know, if you look at the history of infectious diseases, this is an area where observers noted as early as the, the, 18, uh, the 1700s, you know, some of the, the really unusual patterns that beg for explanation, whether it's the cycles of childhood infectious disease uh, in England and Wales, or over here in North America, these were patterns to be explained. And we see it to this day, um, even in uh, pertussis, for example, where waning weights of immunity are present. Um, in, in infectious diseases like chlamydia, sexually transmitted disease, there are huge disparities and uh, across different areas of the population that concentrate it in some of the most vulnerable populations. And all of these patterns you know, raise quandaries to us. If we're trying to understand what's driving these patterns and we have a set of empirical observations of these sort, how are we to make sense of whether they're supportive of or or um, you know, pushing back against our hypotheses, undercutting our hypotheses. It's really challenging when we're exploring this in our head alone because we're not quite sure how all these things add up and relate to uh, the underlying situation. But there's an even bigger challenge that we've all faced as a society and as a world in needing to intervene. Here, we have not only a challenge of making sense of patterns from a system where we're the observer, we're trying to interfere with it, we're trying to bend the curve, we're trying to improve it for the better, you know, um, turn the dial. And we have questions like where to best intervene, how soon, you know, in, the, in areas like uh, the, the, excuse me, the, the um, food system, you know, do we intervene to, to build consumer awareness and knowledge on healthy, um, uh, healthy foods? Uh, do we focus on the growers in, in promoting, you know, the, the, uh, the growth of fresh fruits and vegetables? Uh, do we focus on distributors and, and the availability of refrigeration, et cetera? And on the implementation science side, how do we scale up? Uh, how soon should I see effects? How to make it sustainably, uh, sust sustainable from a financial standpoint? So here we're trying to intervene on different areas of the system and we want to understand what effects will be most salutary, how soon will we see them in the context of this broader system. Um, and you know, in the, in the area of, uh, of, of healthy foods, we have this whole laundry list, a whole menu of different options, you know, um, uh, cash value vouchers such as are distributed by uh, the WIC program. Should we promote healthy cooking classes um, or uh, elevating nutrition standards in childcare and school menus and other thing I've been involved in. Um, you know, should we subsidize community supported agriculture and community gardens or, or help underwrite farmers markets through uh, the provision of amenities for them? Uh, should we regulate unhealthy food production and its promotion to children? Um, we have all these different options which intervene in different areas and we want to know, you know, what will give the biggest bang for the buck? What will offer the greatest, the greatest gains and, and how, how quickly can I, can I really make a difference in some of our poorest neighborhoods? In short, where do we invest our limited resources for action? The challenges here take the challenges that I talked about earlier to a whole nother level because not only do we have a, an underlying system that we're theorizing about, 
but we want to achieve some desired outcomes that involve modifying that system through policies or public health orders or, or new interventions. And it's really challenging uh, to intervene in the system in a way that achieves our outcomes. And sometimes we intervene and see the opposite of what we're seeking. Um, all of this means real challenges. Um, we have misperceptions, unanticipated responses, policy resistant. We, we invest and we just don't see the results that we expect. Um, we have difficulties learning from our experience because it's not clear what was driving it. Coordinating with others, um, planning effectively and designing uh, a healthier future for everyone. In short, we have a systems problem. The problem is not in any one piece or our knowledge of the piece. It's how they all fit together, how they all combine to yield the outcomes. And if we have a system that's misbalanced between like acute care here on the left, uh, over-resourced and public health here on the right, um, we're sure to go in circles. Um, or like King Canute of old um, in England, we may be trying to order back the tide, working against the nature of things instead of with it. And we end up wasting a lot of resources that are precious for things that just won't work, like shouting at the tide to go back. Worse yet, we may end up in blowback, where we trigger a set of changes which come back and hit us smack in the side of our head. So where we subsidize healthy foods only to find it widens the nutritional disparities. Um, we invest in health food subsidies for retailers, but because of the high capital costs associated with things like refrigeration, the ongoing capital expenses, uh, the capital expenses and ongoing operational expenses, it can be difficult for them to, to make it sustainable. Um, uh, we, we invest uh, in, in aggressive uh, interventions, but we end it too early to really see the effects of a system adjusting to our changes. Um, and uh, you know, we, we're working against a system which is optimized to distribute at low cost and high profit margins foods that are unhealthy. So what does this all have to do with the focus of the talk, the so-called vaunted system science? Well, system science, or sometimes called complexity science, is the science of the whole. It's all about making sense of these gnarly, intertangled systems. And it, it's designed, and it's been pursued for decades to help us visualize, understand, and reason about these systems, to test our understanding of these systems with evidence. And there's many tools in this toolbox um, that my group pursues as well as many others. But a central one is the use of what uh, will be termed dynamic models. It goes by many names. Uh, general names like mechanistic models or mathematical models. You also hear by very particular names of sub-methods within it, agent-based modeling or system dynamics modeling or discrete event simulation and, and others. And these models weave together some representation of what we think might be going on out there in a way that is operational. It's, it's kind of a theory in a way that we can say, what if for it? What if this were the case? What would we expect to see? And by representing how things in the world might work, these models can serve as kind of these thinking tools. They, can, they don't tell us what is the case, but they help more quickly identify if our thinking is off base more quickly root out misunderstandings or implausibilities to, to test our hypotheses against the crucible of, of uh, logical consistency and the empirical evidence. So a lot of fancy words here, um, but these simulation models can be viewed as, as these dynamic hypotheses concerning what's going on in the world. Dynamic because we can run them over time. We can see their behavior over time. And they depict interactions, not just of one, but of many pieces all across the system. And they're designed to help us look at counterfactuals, things that have never been observed yet, where there ain't no data because it hasn't happened yet. Um, and there's many, many ways of building these models in particular. I uttered some of their names earlier. Um, but they all share this feature 
of, of rep, trying to represent in some mathematical form what's going on out there in the world. And often they start in a semi-quantitative form that welcomes input by people from all across different disciplines and then move towards a more quantitative formation. Now these models serve many uses and I won't dwell on this slide because I'm gonna talk about several of them, but some of the most important are asking what if questions um, and evaluating benefits of restructuring a system like the food system or understanding trends. But a more, even more basic element is to, to make explicit our thinking, to put it out there in the clear light of day so it can be critiqued and refined and advanced by others. Um, and so that we can aid our, our learning from evidence more quickly. Um, these models are designed to be work with traditional tools. Um, uh, the types of techniques you're learning in epidemiology and, and uh, biostatistics work hand in glove with these sorts of models to deliver, uh, deliver benefit. The types of data you can collect about the food system serve as pieces of nuggets of gold to feed into our systems. I like to think of these models as maps. And, um, and uh, if it seems like a stretch, let me, uh, humor me by, by hearing me out on this. So models like maps are simplification of a very complex world. Maps uh, are useful because they, they hide so many real world details that are distracting to our particular purpose. If we wanna bike across LA, we'd be advised to use a very different map than if we want to tr take public transit across LA and a very different map yet from if we want to drive or even walk across LA. Each of these would be different maps. And yet each of them would, would hide certain details and bring certain ones forward. And so it is with models. So models hide many details about the world and, and just like with maps, it's, it's that hiding of details that makes them useful. With a map, you can stick it on your phone or, or stick it in your back pocket if you don't have a phone. Um, with models, we can run them. Um, we hide many details, but they're specific to purpose. And, and what our purpose is will determine what, what details we hide. Um, so, why do I model? I, I, I model to learn more effectively about the world. One thing is to make my assumptions explicit. I put them down in a form that puts them out there in the clear light of day and lets others say, you missed a link. People from very different backgrounds, people who have never touched a computer, um, can critique my assumptions with a little bit of guidance. This is called a causal loop diagram. Put these out there and people point out, wait, you're missing some interaction between, say, nutrition and poverty, or between stigmatization and dysphoria. Um, not everything goes through you know, employability and poverty. Um, I can get feedback by taking it out of my head and making it explicit. This is something for the food system. This is from a wonderful dissertation by Derek Chan at McGill University that I'd recommend to anyone interested in the food system. Um, and you know, he characterizes in a, in a variant of the causal loop diagram called the system structural diagram, um, uh, how, for example, there are feedbacks involving you know, consumption with building up of marketing in that area that will build more consumption of a given category, let's say healthy foods, understanding of how to put in place effective infrastructure uh, for those types of foods and how to build systems and institutions that will make it sustainable. Um, so when it comes to things like marketing efficiency or investment in efficient refrigeration or distribution for fresh fruits and vegetables uh, or efficiency in the ability for, for food banks to maintain perishable goods you know, uh, consumption can drive the, the need for innovation, which can then make that sort of consumption more, uh, more cheaply, widely affordable, and more available to those uh, vulnerable communities. Um, so you can map out elements of systems. And often we build these in ways that are participatory. We, we draw on stakeholders from the community from stakeholder experts involving the systems, um, 
to help us sort of piece together our understanding, often in a very visual manual form that contributes their understanding of different areas of the system. And even when we build the models, this is from our widely used COVID-19 models, for example. Pardon me, I'm just gonna get, a, get some tea here. Um, we, we, we create them in a fashion that's very visual to, to make our assumptions explicit. So we can go to someone who's a, a health scientist or someone who's a social scientist and, and help understand what the model assumptions are in a visual way. And whether it's COVID-19 or end-stage renal disease or the challenges of opioids, we'll use these sort of models to welcome critique and understanding. But another reason we do them is to make our assumptions precise and testable. Because our models are more than pictures that show our assumptions, as valuable as those are. Um, we, we can take these models and we can run them. And the idea here is, you may have heard a lot about COVID-19 modeling within recent years. Um, who hasn't? And sometimes these models are misportrayed as a as a crystal ball of sorts. Far from being the case. These models are better analogized to a, to a prosthetic, um, like a prosthetic leg. Um, they're, they're things that help us like a prosthesis, a crutch, a cane, or a prosthetic leg to achieve something close to full functionality despite our, 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 our bodily limitations. Um, and in this case, the limitations our models help us with are mental limitations. They help us say, do our hypotheses about what's going on in the world as captured by one of these models, do, do our assumptions as captured precisely in these models, do they add up to simultaneously explain different time series we see? Do they all jibe with what we see from the evidence? Do they all are they all consistent with different lines of evidence? Are they consistent with expert observations from the system? And as such, these models help us learn more quickly by thinking through the implications of our understanding. In other words, if we had these things in our heads, we wouldn't be able to think through what is their precise implication. If we put them down in a model, we're not saying this is the truth, but if this were the truth, what would we expect to see? How does that compare with what we see from the world? And that helps us debug our thinking more quickly. Um, it helps us, you know, when we try to match up empirical observations with our theory, helps us test to what degree are they consistent? To what degree does one follow from the other, or at least is it, is it consistent with another? This is the job of a dynamic model. And the idea here is to look, it's better to be transiently wrong by taking a stance, putting it into a model and testing it than it is to be perpetually confused. Say, I don't know what the situation is. I, I can't model it. Put something down, test it out and learn from it. Francis Bacon said it in the 1600s. Truth will sooner come out of error than from confusion. This is the 1600s version of fail early, fail often. Try something, test it, and you, you, you've taken two steps forward either way. If, if, you're, if it didn't work, you've learned something. If it did work, you've learned something. Either way, you failed forward, or you fail forward. If, if it didn't work, you, you've, still, you've succeeded if it, if it did work. And that's how you refine your thinking. Um, so another reason is we all make decisions based on mental models. Um, we all are operating with some model of the world. Yeah. Typically it's tacit, it's, it's inside our heads. We can't share it with others. We, we can't reason through it totally consistently. It's kind of inchoate and, and not so well formed. But by taking it out of our models, we can, we can test it explicitly what is otherwise opaque, uh, inchoate. And I, I leverage modeling to understand what's going on over time. Um, I'm not going to go into this because I want to show you some models, but often these models are increasingly combined with machine learning. Our group's at the forefront of this to reground them in, in evidence. It's a bit like an MRI scan where we have many lines of evidence in the world, each of which sheds light on the world. Um, and, um, and we can use that to kind of guess what's the underlying situation in the world right now and where's it likely to go. 
Another key thing, though, that we pursue is pursuing intervention effectiveness. So we're, here we're saying, what if we intervene in a certain way? What outcomes would we expect? A model is designed to deal with those sort of counterfactuals. We represent things in our model to ask what if questions. What if this changed? What if that what did? And to see the consequences. So we run the model with alternative assumptions and we say, okay, if we could reduce, you know, the, um, the availability of unhealthy foods in uh, childcare centers and cafeterias of schools by such and such, what would we expect to see in terms of childhood obesity outcomes and nutritional outcomes um, in future in the next 10 years? And we could play that out or we could say, what if we could intervene to make refrigeration more possible for nonprofits offering healthy food in a shared way, um, how might that improve access to healthy foods even amongst the poorest strata of society? So here we use these models to ask what if questions. Um, and different levels of question here require different sophistications of models. Um, some models can answer very rough questions very readily. Um, uh, quick models to build. Others require very, very detailed models to pursue the question. It's really a level of, of matching the expectation with the model. Um, but I've talked too much here, and I, I, I just want to, um, I, I want to offer one final comment on modeling. Why do I model? Because it's, as Winston Churchill said about democracy, it's the worst of all techniques except for everything else I know. Um, it's the least bad of the alternatives. And like King Canute, uh, if we're stuck without the least bad of the alternatives, we may find ourselves inveighing against the tide. So a few ta key take home messages, and I'm going to show you some models um, focused on food system related uh, issues. Um, so um, addressing many practical challenges is especially hard because they exhibit these features of these complex systems. Systems that are not merely complicated, but are also dynamically complex, where the whole is different than the sum of the parts, where we can understand all the world about each piece. Whoa, I unplugged my mic. Um, can you still hear me? Okay, okay, well, I, I hear, I, I see uh, nodding. I, I, I hope that's a good thing. Um, so these, these models, um, focus on complex systems where the whole is different than the sum of the parts and where the whole often exhibits behavior that's surprising given the parts. Where, where if we intervene in one part of the piece of the system, we see action across the entire system and action that often throws us off, that's surprising to us, it's unanticipated. Dynamic modeling provides us these tools in the form of these dynamic models, these these models that are mechanistic in character, that characterize the, the, the positive causal mechanisms to represent reason about the behavior of these systems. And they, these models allow us to express kind of our hypotheses about what's going on in the world in a simplified form. Um, uh, and, and thereby test the degree to which those hypotheses are consistent with the evidence. And if they are, we can ask these what if questions and try to understand why we see certain trends, why we see certain patterns. The models are specific to purpose, how we boil down that food system map that's so big into a tractable component depends on the questions we're bringing to the table or the questions that are brought to our table by decision makers. Um, multiple types of modeling are complementary. Um, and these models have really strong limitations. They work in conjunction with traditional techniques um, and depend on those techniques. But these dynamic models as an integrative tool, a tool to reason about these gnarly and tangled systems, maybe the least bad of the known alternatives for helping us grapple with those systems. Okay, um, so those were some prepared remarks. I'd like to, to walk you through two such models. May will recognize the first of these models very closely um, because she was involved in commissioning it. 
Um, this is a model that we built um, in large part made possible by May's group. Um, but it was a group effort, as good modeling projects typically are. It was an interdisciplinary um, um, one. And it's set in Los Angeles, appropriately enough. Um, so uh, within this model, we depict uh, a, a number of, of different types of, of um, entities or, or, or actors. Um, there's uh, this sort of overall environment. Um, we also have depicted uh, parents, and, parents and guardians who are nested inside households. So there's households and they have guardians and they have children associated with them. Um, the parent and guardian is responsible for um, you know, food procurement, um, uh, for example, seeking fresh fruits and vegetables, um, where they, they seek as part of the regular shopping to obtain them. And they may or may not be enrolled in, in the Women, Infants, and Children program here in California. Um, and uh, when purchasing possible fresh fruits and vegetables within a given store, they're going to have to make a decision whether they can, they can afford a particular instance of this. They have in their charge um, uh, children um, who, who need to eat as well. Um, and they, they have a number of servings they want to eat, uh, I see. And, um, uh, and <laughs> okay, um, so... Uh, if, if, if the servings are available, they eat them another, okay, I don't know why, why crying is in there, but I guess it adds a little bit of, uh, of pathos to it. Um, they're embedded in households and they interact over time with grocery stores. And grocery stores are agents of significance here. They're actors of significance because um, it's the stores that stock or do not stock fresh fruits and vegetables at different levels of affordability. And much of the attention here is not just focused on the consumers who drive the sales, but the stores who equally drive the sales. Um, so the store has some situation with respect to fresh fruits and vegetable inventory um, and, um, and with respect to their selling it. And uh, they have different restocking policies, um, policies for setting the threshold for these and um, reducing the threshold of freshness, may, which may cut down on the, the healthiness of those fresh fruits and vegetables. So we have a depiction in short of consumers and their, their, um, their, their little ones and uh, the grocery stores. And all of this is set in a familiar um, geographic situation. Now, I told you these models capture dynamic hypotheses, and those dynamic hypotheses are kind of writ large uh, over the, what we've just seen with these state charts and these so-called action charts for decision making. But a model is more than a set of pictures that characterize our, our, our hypotheses. It's an operationalizable version of that, so we can run it. and. This model is a particularly evocative characterization of the, of the um, uh, evolution of uh, health status and satisfaction within, um, within the LA context. So we have households, we have uh, WIC stores uh, of different sizes, uh, what are called A50 stores and non-A50 stores and, and very large stores. And what you see here is um, individuals, there's a bit of flashing going on the screen at times, and those are individuals um, heading to the store, for example, in order to uh, apply their shopping needs. So within the LA area, we're simulating the, uh, the shopping going of portions of the population uh, as they go to shop um, over the course of time. And if we run time at just the right amount of speed, you'll see people kind of heading periodically to these stores, purchasing fresh fruits and vegetables. And each household sort of points to the store that it's most commonly frequents. Um, so households do shopping at these stores. They affect the store stocking decisions. The store makes these stocking decisions, which affect which households buy things or what what goods households buy at it. 
and uh, periodically these, uh, these individuals uh, need to restock their goods at home and make those decisions based on what's available at the stores. Some of these individuals have these cash voucher, um, cash value vouchers, which they bring to the stores to redeem for food. And why would we run a model like this? Why would we simulate this behavior? Because we're interested in outcomes. We're interested in outcomes. What are the fruit and vegetable intakes over time associated with this population? We're interested in knowing for WIC related respondents versus non WIC respondents, what levels of fresh fruits and vegetable intakes might we, we be seeing? Um, and we're interested in seeing, you know, how do those compare over time if you have cash uh, voucher uh, availability or um, additional intervention availability, just cash vouchers or no supports as uh, alone. And here we're, we have kind of a set of experiments in the model, what if questions undertaken without, um, without risk because it's on this fake population where we say increase the cash voucher by 100%, we increase accessibility by 67%, and we see you know, what sort of patterns in purchasing among WIC participants is elicited compared to the non-WIC um, uh, the non-WIC participants. So this is a model of kind of um, micro uh, decision making on the part of stores and consumers. That's one sort of model we might use for the food system, made possible through Maze Group um, and the amazing relationship that they had with the WIC population. I'd like to show you another model that has a rather wider focus, but is also focused uh, on the health system uh, excuse me, excuse me, on the food system, I misspeak. I was seconded for 13 months to the health system to, uh, to lead our provincial modeling and uh, I still sometimes speak out of turn. Um, so in this context, we have a nationwide model um, and this model involves um, four tiers of, um, of parties across the, uh, across the nation. Here we have uh, suppliers, those are shown in blue, like this one for, uh, for apples, this one for onions, this one for wheat flour, this one over here for walnuts. Um, and we have a set of one level down from them, what are, are called producers. Now producers uh, are involved in uh, taking those and, and, uh, and placing them in products, um, in products, for example, packaging apples for a healthier case, or perhaps producing mac macaroni and cheese for a not so healthy, uh, for a not so healthy case, or onion rings, um, which also, despite some um, Trump era regulations, do not count as a fresh fruit and vegetable, um, and an apple pie. Some of these apples make their way to the consumers, but some turn, get turned into apple pie and some of the, um, uh, some of the cheese um, gets turned into mac and cheese, et cetera. Um, uh, so here we have those two levels, suppliers. Um, these might be called manufacturers or producers. We also have distributors and distributors play a really important role when it comes to fresh fruits and vegetables because they need refrigerated trucks to carry those fresh fruits and vegetables. And those refrigerated trucks um, are needed um, in a way that imposes expenses, which load some expenses onto the fresh fruit and vegetable supplier chain. And these will specialize in certain types of goods. And there's ones here that specialize in refrigerated goods versus not refrigerated goods. Um, and that have relationships with some of these uh, producers. And then finally, uh, the last two levels are there are retailers um, that sell different types of goods. Um, here, this one in, in uh, Los Angeles selling apple pie or this one in San Diego selling onion rings. Um, uh, but also um, they have consumers which are purchasing at different levels. And a model like this can help us understand the system-wide consequences 
of changes in consumer demand and the need to reorient the system across all these different levels to really make possible efficient, accessible, cheap, and, and affordable food to all segments of society. So this is a model that uses many levels of the supply chain to capture system-wide effects germane to, um, to healthy eating. So I'm going to stop there um, and uh, we'll see if we could, you know, uh, use any uh, closing minutes that remain to, uh, to answer any questions or to uh, 